Hello, everyone, and welcome to our LEC seminar. Um, it is my extreme pleasure to welcome my friend uh, and uh, colleague, Dr. Enrique Schwerkoff. Schwerkoff. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Where are my notes? <laughs> um, Dr. Shorkoff joins us from North Carolina State University, where he is currently a postdoc in Katie Heal's lab. He received a PhD from Washington State University, where his dissertation addressed the evolutionary significance of recombination hotspots using statistical computational mathematical tools. Before that, he received his undergraduate degree from Universidad de los Andes in Merida, Venezuela. And his research has been published in Gene, BMC Genomics, and Proc B. So, Enrique, thank you so much for joining us, and I'm excited to hear about your work. Uh, thank you, Liz, for that introduction. Um, I'm glad to be here talking to all of you. Um, I think I'll jump right in. Okay, uh, let me move some stuff out of my way. Cool. Uh, so I'm gonna to talk to you today a little bit about the evolution of recombination rate variation. I know that that is a very vague title, but I had not figured out what I was gonna talk about uh, when I wrote it. Um, mostly things are gonna be focused around uh, domestication, I think. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, uh, uh, I need to address what recombination is uh, for everybody in the room. So, um, re Combination, very simply put, is the exchange of, or at least in the context that I'm going to be speaking about it today, is the exchange of genetic information between homologous chromosomes uh, during meiosis. So what does that look like? Very roughly speaking, uh, let's say we have a pair of homologous chromosomes with uh, different alleles at the A locus and different alleles at the B locus. Uh, during meiosis, those uh, chromosomes will likely um, come into contact with each other uh, as part of the meiotic process. Um, and they may uh, recombine. And one form of recombination, which is the one that I'll be focusing on at the beginning of my talk, is uh, crossing over. And it's sort of the more famous one that uh, you know, we usually think of. Uh, the outcome of them uh, recombining will be a pair of um, uh, parental chromosomes right, gametes with the parental chromosomes and uh, another pair with recombinant chromosomes where this new combination of, um, of alleles is present that was not present in the parents. Um, why is it important or why do we care about it? Well, uh, I showed you two different homologous chromosomes, but in a population, different individuals will have a whole variety of them with all kinds of different um, variants at different loci. Um, and uh, what'll happen over multiple generations of those, uh, of recombination occurring is that we'll end up with these sort of mosaic chromosomes that have variants that originated from uh, a bunch of different parents in some population in a previous state. Uh, and what that means is that the fate of particular alleles on, on certain backgrounds will no longer be tied to the rest of that background. Um, uh, sort of a, a classic view of that, um, which was illustrated by Crow and Kimura in 1970, uh, is uh, represented in this figure where the x-axis is time moving forward toward the right, and the y-axis is a representation of sort of the frequency of a particular, uh, of the different haplotypes in this population. And so uh, originally it's 100% this little a, little b, uh, eventually the big B allele arises, and we're assuming that both the, a, the big A and the big B allele are beneficial, but that the big A, big B haplotype is the most beneficial. Um, what happens in an asexual uh, population, which is the same dynamics that happen in a population that doesn't recombine, but on a different scale, uh, is, whoops, sorry, is that, uh, you know, big B will arise on, on some background and it'll increase in frequency for a time potentially, but uh, it'll be competing with the big A allele that has arisen on that background. Um, eventually, you know, big A allele uh, 
wins that wins out uh, the big A little B, and uh, for that uh, once it is fixed, if we assume that mutation is rare enough, we have to wait. You know, after the fixation of that big A for the big B uh, mutation to arise on that particular background, and then uh, obtain that sort of ideal haplotype in this uh, hypothetical scenario. Uh, the difference in a sexual population is that, uh, you know, big A and big B can arise um, and through sexual reproduction or through recombination, depending on uh, where those alleles arise uh, on chromosomes, uh, they can be brought together pretty quickly. And then this big A, big B haplotype can sweep through the population uh, much faster. And so, uh, Essentially, no longer is the big A allele's fate necessarily tied to the little b uh, allele, but it can actually recombine and, and, and you know, optimal uh, combinations can occur. And so that uh, also allows for uh, a reduction in hitchhiking. So, you know, if you have a, in a sort of more than two locus model, if you have uh, a beneficial allele that's increasing in frequency, any lightly deleterious alleles around it will also increase in frequency with it and can potentially sort of slow down the process of fixation of that beneficial allele um, and, and sort of vice versa. And so recombination can help purge deleterious alleles and fix beneficial alleles um, more quickly than in its absence. Uh, but recombination rate varies, right? Uh, it varies. Um, you know, uh, between, it, it can vary within an individual over time, right? As, as they age, um, this has been seen in, in Drosophila in the past. Uh, it can vary between uh, sexes within the same species. Um, it can vary between populations. It varies along the chromosome. Um, but the one that I'm going to be sort of, is gonna be central to what I'm gonna talk about today is variation, um, between uh, population or population species, you know that line is not the clearest, but let's say variation between species. Um, so this is a figure that I like a lot um, from uh, Stapley et al. from 2017 in the review of recombination variation and recombination rate, uh, where they show a bunch of different groups of eukaryotes and they show how much variation there is uh, between the different groups, but also within the groups. So each dot is a measurement of recombination rate in a particular species. Uh, and the, you know, each, these are all uh, log rates and, and Sunny Morgans per mega base pairs. Um, but the important thing to notice is, you know, like these, these variations are pretty, whoops, are pretty wide, uh, both between the species and within a species itself, or between the groups and within the groups. So between species that are closely and distantly related. Um, Specifically, uh, I have become interested in the question of recombination and domestication. Sorry, how, how recombination changes in, in the face of domestication. Uh, and so some of the early work on this was done in plants and uh, a really cool paper from uh, Jeffrey Rossabar in 2004, where he looked at 26 different species pairs, including maize and teosinte and cucumber and a bunch of other ones, just throw in a couple of examples and measure the recombination rate um, in, in, in the different pairs. Uh, and what he found was sort of a consistent higher recombination rate in the domesticated species, uh, which can make sense, right? Domestication is essentially a form of strong artificial selection. And so in order for that to happen more efficiently, perhaps a higher recombination rate is ideal. Um, Interestingly, a, a similar study was done in mammals uh, by Munoz Fuentes and collaborators in 2017, where they looked at pairing of goat and ibex and chief sheep and mouflon and dog and wolf. And what they found was actually almost the opposite, a marginally lower recombination rate in the domesticated species. Um, so there's kind of a dichotomy between those two different groups. And in fact, the, the, the dog wolf, um, I saw a really interesting talk at uh, Evolution last year uh, where they had constructed recombination maps of dogs and wolf. And they also again found that the, the 
the dog uh, had the, the lower re overall recombination rate. Um, and so that's kind of uh, a head scratcher. And the first time that I kind of ran into this, this broad question in this uh, uh, scenario was what, during my PhD when I was working on recombination in theobroma cacao. So theobroma cacao is um, uh, the cocoa tree where we get chocolate from, right? And uh, I was uh, measuring recombination in uh, a few different species or populations, which were distributed through South and Central America. Um, 10 of them to be exact, um, nine of them in South America and one of them is Criollo uh, population, which is the only of these that is considered to be domesticated um, in Central America. Um, so we had full genome uh, sequencing data for all of these and we used a uh, uh, sort of population genetics based method to measure recombination. So the way that this measure this this method works is it tries to reconstruct the history of recombination in a population. We did this for each of the different populations, each of the different chromosomes. Uh, roughly speaking, the way it works is uh, imagine that these black bars are your chromosome and these are variants that come from one or another ancestral state, or there are one allele or another, right? So we have this red allele or the blue allele at these two different loci along that chromosome, uh, and the population will have some frequency of each of these four. Uh, these methods, what they do is they sort of reconstruct a history. So for example, in this case, say it started with the blue and we had a red mutation on, on the blue background and a different red mutation on the blue background and then a, a red mutation on the red blue background. And maybe this is the history of this particular uh, set of chromosomes that we have. And so this is sort of a, a normal coalescent where things just kind of coalesce into each other. Um, but we can also uh, reconstruct this history with a um, coalescent with uh, recombination. And so, you know, uh, an original red background, first blue mutation, and then a blue mutation on the other end. And now this, uh, sorry, this double blue uh, occurred through sort of the recombination between these two. And so you can imagine that there's many different ways of reconstructing these, these potential genetic histories with different amounts of recombination events in them. Um, and so what these programs do is they simply uh, look for sort of the most likely or the one that best explains the, the frequencies of the different um, uh, haplotypes in the population. Cool. So it does that for uh, pairs. Sim the simplest version is it does it for pairs of SNPs along the genome and it just kind of moves along and measures it along the entire chromosome. Um, cool. And so what we end up with are uh, recombination maps that look something like this, where we have recombination rate on the, on the y-axis and position along a chromosome on the x-axis. In this case, I just have a couple uh, of example chromosomes. So the third chromosome from the Nanai population and the third chromosome from the Bruce population, both of them are these sort of non-domesticated ones. But you can already see just by the scale that the recombination rates are, are, are kind of different and they were actually significantly different when we, when we measured them, but also their pattern is different. And these bars at the top represent recombination hotspots, which was sort of more the focus of that, of that work, but it's not something I'm gonna get into today. And those recombination hotspots are just regions with more recombination than others. Um, the cool thing that's sort of relevant to my talk today is that we found that recombination rates were much higher in the domesticated population. When I say higher, I mean two orders of magnitude higher, um, which was really exciting because it, it matches uh, sort of the findings of, of Rossi Barra to, to some extent. Um, but we, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper and try to understand uh, a potential mechanism. And we did uh, by way of uh, a recombination suppressing protein called FIGL1 and actually its partner, FLIP. So these are two proteins that um, can independently reduce recombination rate, but when they're both present, reduce it even more. Um, and we actually found a uh, mutation at the, in, the, in that protein uh, in the cacao population, and sorry, in the criollo population, which is the domesticated cacao. 
Uh, so in this figure on the x-axis, uh, don't worry too much about the ID, but essentially these are amino acid changes that we identified in the, in the DNA sequence of, of, of the fecal one uh, gene in Criollo. Um, and then on the y-axis, we have populations and they're ordered, in, uh, they're ordered by uh, uh, descending, re re sorry, ascending recombination rate. So amino nalo has the lowest and Criollo is the highest. Um, and then each different square, if it doesn't have a number, then that mutation was simply not present. And whatever number it is, it's the frequency of uh, homozygous individuals with that, or yeah, the, of homozygosity of, of that mutation. So, uh, you know, for example, Kurodai for this 270QQ mutation, 20% uh, of them were, of the individuals that we, that we sampled were homozygous for the mutant. Uh, uh, for the alternative allele. Uh, in Criollo, we actually found two uh, different mutations that were fixed, which indicate a likely, you know, change or loss of, of function um, in the, for the, or in this case, change of function uh, in the Criollo uh, population, which, you know, if your recombination suppressing gene is broken, then you would expect your recombination rate to skyrocket, which is what we see in Criollo. And we actually see uh, the same pattern with uh, a couple of mutations in the FLIP, which I'm not showing here in the sort of partner protein to FIGL1. So that, that was really exciting. And, and we started thinking about when this FIGL1 FLIP combo tends to act. Um, so I'm going to use this figure from Dapper and Pacer, partly because I like how it split things up, but also because uh, that paper is really cool. And um, I'm gonna come back to these uh, red and blue uh, rectangles, but um, after I kind of walk through the fecal flip stuff. So for now, try to ignore them. Um, they were not really easy to cover up. So they're just gonna kind of be there, but blur your eyes a little bit. Okay, so I briefly talked about recombination at the top, but here I'm gonna get a little bit more into sort of the different steps in the process. Uh, we start with the double strand break formation where essentially a, a piece of DNA sort of identified and uh, is split, it's broken. Um, maybe, there we go. And then uh, the, the next step is double strand break processing where that uh, the, the DNA is essentially prepared for uh, uh, the next step, which is homology, homology search and strand invasion, uh, where uh, the, the other um, homologous chromosome is searched for uh, that homologous region and uh, the strand invasion can occur. So one of the strands from, from the broken DNA can invade the, the intact DNA and recombination can occur. Um, next step is synapsis. So at this point, strand invasion has occurred and these two uh, chromosomes are, are kind of tightly tied together. Um, then there is a crossover or non-crossover decision, which I'll get into a little later, but essentially whether the whole chromosome is going to shuffle or if it's just going to be a little piece of what we call gene conversion. So uh, the, the, the intact chromosome sort of substitutes a little bit of the, of the There's resolution where uh, you know the DNA is is the, the holiday junction is is resolved and, and essentially the DNA uh, the two chromosomes are now again separated. So uh, Fiegel one and Flip act in this homology search and strand invasion uh, step. Uh, it act, they actually interact with Rad fifty one and DMC one, um, which is which is super cool. So uh, this is where they act. Um, and now is when I get to the little rectangles. Um, in this study, uh, they looked at mammals and uh, they chose sort of important proteins at each of the different steps of recombination to uh, uh, look at um, whether they would undergone positive selection. And so the deeper the red, the more positive selection, the more evidence of positive selection they found. And uh, sort of the, the strongest point where they observed uh, uh, this, this positive selection or interesting point for those of us who care about how much crossover happens is that this crossover non-crossover decision. Um, whereas despite one 
protein showing some positive selection, it's fairly confident that double strand break formation, or at the very least, the selection of which locations were going to undergo a double strand break, uh, were not really um, changing very much, or, or did not seem to be under positive selection in, in mammals. Uh, so it, it seems like crossover, non-crossover decision is the place to be for mammals, whereas what we've observed in plants, it might have something to do with the homology search and strand invasion. So given that double strand break formation is maintained relatively intact, and this has been observed in a few different species. Uh, now in my postdoc, I'm, I'm interrogating a little bit of trying to find out what's going on in this crossover, non-crossover decision. Um, and I started doing that in, in yeast, which is uh, the organism of choice uh, here at the Hyo Lab. Um, and where I'm, where I'm asking how are uh, sort of crossover or non-crossover events distributed along the genome and how that might be related to the evolutionary history of a population. Um, I'm doing this in uh, Saccharomyces uh, uvarum, but um, before we get too deep into it, let's talk a little bit about that double strand break resolution. So like we said, recombination begins with this double strand break formation. We have a strand invasion. And then there are a couple of different ways that that, that break uh, can be resolved. We can do the through the double strand break repair pathway or simply by strand annealing. Um, and uh, if the double strand break pathway is followed, then um, a crossover occurs. And so that's simply the example that I showed at the very beginning where essentially half the chromosome or, you know, not necessarily half, but one part of the chrom of the of the red chromosome is attached to the rest of the blue, and one part of the blue is attached to the rest of the red. However, independent of which pathway they go, there is actually a few other uh, ways that that can be resolved. Right. So, in this case, we have a mix of crossovers and non-crossovers in the type two and type four, but generally speaking, we can we can classify them as having had a non-crossover event or having had a crossover event, right? So the type two and type three are essentially nothing more than a combination of the two. So that earlier, there are two relevant categories for us, the crossover and the non-crossover. And so we wanna try to measure crossover and non-crossovers in uh, the whole genome of, of an organism. And so, using those LD methods like the ones that I use for, for cacao uh, is not really the best way to do this because we those cacao ones are looking into the past and these non-crossover events are so small that they tend to be lost um, pretty quickly. So ideally we would wanna observe, you know, take two parents and see in like exactly where recombination events happen so that we can reconstruct these sort of detailed, you know, uh, uh, non-crossover events, right? They'll tend to get lost in the, in the, in the history uh, if we try to use those population genetics-based uh, methods. Um, and that is where yeast is actually a really cool uh, uh, model for this uh, because we can actually play around with its reproduction and, and have a clear idea of what the the, um, the sequence is for the parents and for the offspring, um, the, specifically those parents' offspring. So why is that? So yeast has a haploid phase where they are haploid. Um, so if you take a couple of parents with very you know differences between them and, and at a few different loci, ideally a lot of loci, um, and allow them to uh, to uh, come together, reproduce sexually with each other, uh, well, uh, produce a, a zygote, produce uh, um, a, a diploid cell, uh, you can then, uh, uh, when it undergoes sexual reproduction and produces uh, you know, these gametes or these spores, um, they sit inside of this envelope in these uh, sort of tetrad, as, as, as we call them, they sit inside of this envelope where you know, one of them, you'll Assuming there was a, a crossover event, uh, you'll have two parentals and, and two recombinant for this particular chromosome that we're interested in. And it's actually uh, 
fairly feasible to uh, get rid of that envelope and then separate each of the different uh, meiotic products. And then because yeast uh, can reproduce asexually in the haploid stage, just produce, let them grow uh, sort of separate from each other so that we then have a bunch of uh, uh, essentially a lot of DNA material that's true to that original crossover event or that original sexual reproduction. Um, and so, yeah, we do that. Um, we can then sequence them and then code them by which parent each of the, uh, each of the SNPs along the, the chromosome belong to. So for example, blue parent is one and red parent is zero. Uh, we can code all of them up. And then we can do that with a bunch of different tetrads um, and Essentially, uh, there are programs that can just look through these ones and zeros and tell us, you know, was it a type one, a type two, a type three, whatever. Um, and so we did that for two different crosses, 50 tetrads per cross. Um, the lab work has been done. It's currently, you know, this is data that's on my computer. Unfortunately, I can't yet show you uh, what we found because we're still finishing up processing some stuff so we can make some cool figures. Um, but unfortunately I didn't make it uh, for this talk, but we do have a few specific questions uh, that I can talk about. One of them is simply trying to understand the distribution of these crossovers and non-crossovers in Saccharomyces euvarum. Um, and we can actually compare it to Cerevisiae and, and Paradoxus, and these two other yeast species um, for which uh, these maps have been made before. So this is a, a paper Zhang et al from 2019. Uh, where they calculated crossover rate and non-crossover rate um, and also use a double strand break map to, to compare, uh, try to see what was going on. And, and interesting for sort of the questions that we're asking is that the double strand break map is actually pre very well conserved when compared to the crossover or non-crossover rate between these species. So we're very excited to see where um, Saccharomyces euvarum lands in this, and if we see sort of some cool new patterns and uh, uh, try to understand maybe why, why those crossovers and non-crossovers uh, happen where they do. Um, and one of the things that, that we think might be the case is maybe it has something to do with its evolutionary history, right? Maybe uh, ones that uh, exist in nature versus ones that uh, uh, are a part of fermentation and have potentially undergone some level of domestication or some level of like, strong artificial selection might have different distributions of crossovers and non-crossovers. And in fact, that's something that we can try to touch on in, uh, with the data that we have. One of our two crosses is between uh, pairs of, um, uh, of yeast that were taken from more natural environments, so from tree bark and from uh, uh, a Drosophila fly. Um, and then our, our other pairing is from uh, one, uh, one yeast that was one strain that was isolated from um, wine and one of them that was isolated from, forget the word for it, but after you press on the grapes, but before they turn into wine from there. Uh, so potentially those, those fermentation associated ones might have, or human fermentation associated ones might have uh, a, a different history and that might impact um, their crossover and non-crossover distribution along the chromosome, which is help us sort of get, get at that idea of how does this strong uh, artificial selection um, affect the, the resolution of double strand breaks, um, which might be sort of at the heart of, of understanding why recombination rates change um, between domesticated and non-domesticated. Uh, so yeah, so we know that we have higher recombination rate in domesticated cacao, right? Um, much higher, and that matches sort of what was observed by uh, Jeffrey Rossabara. Um, and we have a potential explanation for it, which is this modifier uh, that can be found in plants. And actually that modifier was identified in Arabidopsis. Um, interestingly, fecal and flip also exist in, in uh, across animals. Um, so that kind of still leaves the questions of, of, well, why aren't we seeing a similar sort of uh, uh, 
pattern when we when we look at uh, at mammals that have undergone um, you know strong artificial selection or or domestication. Um, that's sort of the the guiding question um, as I've been moving from my from my PhD into my into my postdoc. Um, yeah, basically thinking about how can we how can we try to disentangle this, right? And so essentially two central ideas uh, have come to mind for me. The first one being that uh, perhaps there's a, a, a variation uh, problem, right? So maybe in plants, there for some reason tends to be standing variation at these fecal flip uh, loci or some other recombination modifier uh, that allows plants to, to respond to this, uh, uh, to, to have a, a, a change in recombination type response when they, uh, when they're presented with this strong artificial selection or this sort of domestication process. Or the, the other question that I, uh, that I want to, the other hypothesis, which is the one that I want to uh, look at, is uh, it's possible that the way that we domesticate plants versus the way that we domesticate animals uh, differs in such a way that a modifier of recombination is favored in the plant case, but not in the animal case. So the idea of this potential um, uh, direction or this, this potential explanation actually came from uh, a conversation I had a few years ago with uh, a colleague and friend of mine um, where I was discussing, hey, it's, you know, this weird dichotomy. Um, and she turned to me uh, and said, well, animals have faces, uh, which in that moment occurred to me as, oh, we tend to be more empathetic toward animals than we tend to be toward plants. It's kind of true, kind of not, you know, uh, but it is true that like the domestication process for animals and for plants can be very different, you know, among other things, plants can, can uh, propagate vegetatively. And so that bottleneck uh, for, for plants um, in the, those early domestication uh, stages can be, you know, very, very uh, uh, strong, right? Whereas the ones in animals may be a little, a little weaker. Um, another possibility is the kind of traits that maybe we are trying to select for in plants versus animals. So when you think about domesticated animals, let's take as a sort of convenient example, dogs, you know, a lot of what has happened with dog domestication and, and what happened especially early on was uh, sort of a selection for tameness, right? For a behavior. And those behavioral traits might have a more complicated uh, sort of genetic, uh, uh, genetic background than might be the case for, again, a convenient example, cacao, where selection was happened on specifically that chocolate flavor, which, you know, might be, uh, uh, you know, if the desirable trait is for it to taste a particular way, that might be a single compound that maybe is made by one or a few different, or is produced by one or, or a few different proteins in the, in the process. And, and therefore you're selecting on very few uh, loci very strongly. And so I'm still working on wrapping my head around what, how to codify that. But essentially the idea is to uh, look at this very strong selection on a few loci uh, with a very strong um, bottleneck versus uh, perhaps a, a weaker bottleneck and selection on multiple loci, you know. Um, and the way, oh, that shouldn't be there the whole time. Oh, well. The way that I uh, wanted to approach that is through simulations. Um, and I, uh, at least initially with simulations, uh, I plan to use SLIM, which is a, a, a population genetic simulator, um, which has you know, explicit chromosomes and uh, uh, it's 
forward as a forward simulator, so time moves forward. Uh, and explicit loci, so we can have things like genetic distance between a pair of loci that we're interested in. And sort of roughly a sketch of what that simulation would be like is we would uh, simulate a neutrally evolving chromosome, define a mutation that changes the recombination rate, add uh, that modifier, right, that mutation that changes the recombination rate at a frequency of 0 0.5. So far, that's what I'm thinking. Um, and then we apply selection and demographic events that mimic domestication and track the frequency of that modifier. So, you know, we would have this explicit chromosome, we would define a modifier, and after allowing the, the, the chromosome to evolve neutrally for a time, we would introduce that modifier somewhere along that chromosome uh, with, a, with a frequency of 0.5. In this case, I think that would be convenient because it's easy to track. Uh, how its, a, its frequency is affected by, uh, by the selection that we're gonna apply to it. And then, uh, you know, we define it, we allow those things to happen. Maybe there's a bottleneck. And then after the bottleneck, there's selection on, on multiple different loci. We can play around with things like the size of the bottleneck, the, the type of selection, how strong selection is, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but try to like separate all of these different factors that might be involved and figure out which ones are, are sort of the most important ones. And the cool thing about working in uh, a yeast lab that works on uh, uh, sort of evolution in, in, in yeast is that we can do evolutionary experiments in the lab to sort of, to try to uh, complement these, these simulations, which I'm really excited about because like I said, we, we have a lot of ability to play around with yeast and, and we can apply different selective pressures and we can change the population size and do all kinds of fun stuff. That's sort of what I'm excited for uh, in the near future. Cool. Uh, so that went way faster than I expected, but hopefully that's good. Um, uh, I do wanna acknowledge a lot of people that uh, were involved in a lot of the work that I did. So the Cornejo lab, so Omar Cornejo, who was my uh, advisor for my PhD and the Kelly lab, which was sort of a co-lab with it and everybody in both of those labs, um, just really supportive group of people. Um, uh, Bush lab, so Jeremiah Bush, who was on my committee and everyone in their lab was always, in his lab was always very collaborative with, with me. I wanna take a second to highlight uh, Nate Lehman, who is, uh, Really cool guy. He uh, was a senior PhD student when I came into the program, and then he was a postdoc at University of Idaho uh, in my last couple of years. Um, and essentially, uh, earlier this year, I realized that if you can be Nate Lehman to somebody else, do it. So Nate is a guy who like will help you with whatever. Like is always there for you. Really good listener. Uh, really good question asker. But just more than anything else, just a really supportive dude who's like really just wants to help. So try to be Nate Lehman to somebody today. Um, Dick Mikaiwitz, who was also on my committee, uh, very helpful uh, with thinking about uh, a lot of the population genetics of all of this. Um, the Kenny HPC, which is where thing, all of the, the analyses that you saw from my PhD ran and are currently still running. Some of them, uh, Yelling and Halenbotham endowments, which uh, paid for my travel, which was awesome. And then uh, I want to thank the, the Ohio lab and specifically Nathan Brandt, who is the lab tech here and who ran all of the lab work for that, uh, for that ongoing project that we're doing with the crossover and non-crossover because I'm completely incompetent in the lab. And then uh, one last little note uh, that is I had some blank space. So I put uh, this gorgeous little dog Drift here who is, is named after the evolutionary force. And he is not my dog, but he did live with me for like the last semester of my PhD. And uh, just as a reminder that when things are really rough, it's not a bad idea to have someone or something that kind of depends on you because it lets you kind of get out of your head and kind of keep chugging forward. Uh, cool, thanks. Thank you so much for that talk. I am 
I have a bunch of things going through my head, so I can't wait to talk to you one on one. Um, our first question comes from John Birmingham Jr., who asks, does FIGL1 act in the same pathway as PRDM9? Uh, no, that's a really interesting question. No, it does not. So PRDM9 is actually involved in that first process of determining uh, double strand breaks. So it doesn't affect the amount of double strand breaks, but rather the position of double. Okay, it looks like we're having some trouble. Okay, 